thank you so much, uh, Dr. Britton. Um, and I also just want to say thanks so much to Kayla Jackson and to, to Gabriela Cruz, Professor Cruz, um, who are collaborators on this wonderful project that, that hopefully over the next two years, you guys will find out more about and uh, hope, you know, uh, you can participate in potentially. Um, so, um, she um, Will Wilson, you know, she, uh, Kiani Inchle, do, um, Irish and Welsh, Bashashchi, um, my, my che is Tapaha, and, and my Nellies were Irish and Welsh, right, Belaganas, um, and, um, I grew up, uh, kind of between San Francisco, California, um, where my dad was from, and, uh, Tuba City, and I went to Tuba City boarding school. I'm a Thunderbird. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I ended up getting this crazy scholarship from, from Tuba. There, there was a, a foundation called A Better Chance um, that takes kind of low-income minority kids, either from very rural or very urban settings, um, and gives them scholarships to go to like fancy East Coast prep schools. So I ended up going to Tuba City from Tuba. Uh, I had never been like east of Windorock um, <laughs> to, to, to going to high school in, in Massachusetts. Um, and that kind of set me off on, you know, I guess an educational adventure. Uh, I went to Oberlin College in Ohio, uh, studied art history and studio art, you know, particularly photography. Um, and then after Oberlin, I, wanted to head back west and I uh, went to the University of New Mexico um, in Albuquerque to get my, my uh, master's in fine art and photography. Um, so I guess I should show you some images. Um, let me let me grab the screen here. Just a, a little bit of a, like how much time should I should I do the slideshow for? Um. Well, we wanted to leave time, uh, Will, for some um, questions. So okay. um, like um, 35 or 40 minutes. Okay. Is that all right? Yeah, no, that's great. I'll just I'll use that to, as a reference to keep track. Um, okay. Let's see. Can you all see that, the Indian today? slide there okay yep. um so you know uh for the last few years i've been starting off my my talks about my work with this image um just because a lot of my work has to do with how much has changed in such a short amount of time uh you know in our in our lives like within a couple generations um things have completely transformed uh you know um on the navajo nation and, and everywhere else but i think particularly um, for Diné people and for the way that, that, you know, we exist in the world. Um, this image here, uh, is actually a photograph of my family. So the little girl in the foreground is my mother and she's there with her, uh, two older sisters and they are heading from our summer sheep camp, which is pretty close to the tuba junction. Um, if you're coming from flag and then, um, they were headed to town, you know, they're headed to the tuba trading post and, and that's how they got around. Um, they met an editorial photographer named Ray Manley. Um, there was some money exchanged and, you know, this photo was made and he had this kind of editorial vision of, you know, Navajo people in poverty. Um, I think my family was actually pretty well off, you know, my, my, um, my grandmother and, and grandfather had, you know, like 500 head of sheep and uh, my Che had like amazing fields just below Tuba in Curly Valley, um, really close to the Mooncopi fields down there. Um, and, you know, I think they were well off, but, but, you know, it's an interesting, I think, way to think about photography and how photography can tell different narratives and different stories. Um, which has been a big part of kind of my 
my work. So when I first started doing photography, you know, it was in high school and in college, it was all analog. Digital hadn't happened yet. Um, this is a picture of me and, and Shimasana, um, Martha at City, um, who I'll talk a little bit about later. But, um, you know, I think this documentary style that, oops, okay, I'm trying to figure out how to move my images forward. Um, was well, something that, that spoke to me, it resonated with me, documentary photography, black and white. Um, I'm shooting all film at this point um, and really kind of focusing on my family, my friends, my life um, in and around Tuba. Um, so when I ended up um, kind of at the end of my high school years, I had to figure out what I wanted to do. And I decided that I wanted to kind of pursue, pursue the arts, pursue photography. I went to a, a school called Oberlin College, which is a small liberal arts um, college in, in Northeast Ohio. Um, and, you know, I got to participate in a lot of different kind of events and, and did colloquiums with different artists. And, uh, there's a Cheyenne artist named Edgar Heap of Birds, um, whose work you might have run across, but he did a colloquium and he really encouraged me to think about, I guess, the way that I was using these images of my family and my friends and, and um, kind of challenged me to, to change the way that they were being, um, I guess, exhibited, but also received by an audience. And, and he suggested installation art. So, Kind of the, the idea behind installation art, at least my understanding of it at the time, was it was a way to kind of construct a, a space or an environment that forced people to relate to the photographs in a different way. You know, you couldn't just kind of look at these images behind glass on a wall. Uh, you almost had to, you know, kind of participate in, in these spaces physically. Um, so it, I think, at least for me, you know, in my understanding, of the way that these images um, were, were received, it, it transformed that, right? You, you, you had to like interact, like your body was in space in a different way in relation to the photographs. Um, and, you know, that's something that's been important to me, I think throughout uh, my, my work and my career. Um, this is a work that I did um, when I first started graduate school. So when I first moved to Albuquerque, um, and it's actually a family photo album because I've kind of been the, the family photographer for, for a few generations. And we had these big, you know, summer get togethers on Father's Day. And, um, you know, I, I was wondering about the way historically uh, Native Americans had been um, represented photographically and was playing with those ideas and, and, and kind of, I guess, understand better like this, this idea of um, a snapshot or a mugshot um, or the way that, you know, pictures could be controlled by different, I guess, groups um, and audiences. Um, in the end, again, I turned to installation work um, and photography. So this was in 1997 and this was my MFA show, right? So at the end of your time in graduate school, you, us you usually have to pull off a big uh, exhibition. And so I decided to create these boat forms. Um, you know, this walkway here is kind of roughly the diameter of a small Hogan. Um, and everybody in the, in the images is, you know, someone close to me, uh, mostly uh, Kia'ani folk, um, but, so a little bit of a shift, a little bit of a jump into the future. Um, this is a project that I started in actually 2004 and I'm, it's kind of ongoing and it, and it relates to um, this grant that I'm gonna be working with um, Gabby Cruz and, and hopefully some of you guys, uh, Danae College kind of collaboratively um, around photography and, and the environment, right? So um, this work is entitled Autoimmune Response. And the idea is that um, because of these rapid changes in kind of economy, food ways, life ways, um, 
you know, autoimmune disease has resulted and, and diabetes is probably the most well-known kind of incident of that, right? Um, Native American people are oh. disproportionately affected by um, autoimmune disease. Uh, but it's not just about autoimmune disease, it's, it's a response, right? So how do we respond to this situation? How do we move forward kind of you know, create solutions to these to these problems that have arisen. And um, in this series, I'm kind of playing this post apocalyptic um, Navajo man who's like wandering the landscape trying to figure out what's happened. Um, there's a it's hard to see here, but there's a little bit of a nuclear explosion. Um, from one of the Nevada test site images that I uh, used an early version of Photoshop to plug into this picture. Um, Let's see. Thank you. So this, this series of work uh, was first exhibited at the Heard Museum there in Phoenix. I was invited by a curator um, to, to present an exhibition. Uh, and so I kind of quickly <laughs> got to work and created some of these images. Um, this is autoimmune response two, I believe. And this is at the confluence of the Little Colorado and Colorado rivers. So just kind of north and west of Cameron, um, you know, the Little Colorado and the Colorado join. And this is actually from the, you know, the, the Navajo Nation side. Um, and it's pretty close to where my family has their winter sheep camp. Um, so it's this, you know, incredibly kind of powerful, beautiful, sacred place um, that I got to use as, as part of my narrative, you know. Um, so the protagonist, which is played by me, right? So there's, there's a performative aspect to this work, um, finds a Hogan uh, and it becomes a laboratory of sorts to figure out how to, how to deal with um, this situation that he's found himself in. Um, you know, the world has kind of become toxic to him for some reason, and he's got to figure out how to how to survive and, and potentially how to create, you know, solutions in relation to that. Um, this work in particular, I, I was thinking about the, the creation story, um, you know, the, the hero twins born of water and monster slayer, who make um, this world habitable for for uh, Dene, for, for humans. To, um, and there's some reference, I think, in this to, to environmental toxicity, right? Um, and I, I, you know, I've been, I think, cognizant of the, the kind of negative history of extraction, both from coal, uranium um, on the Navajo Nation. And, and so those are some of the things that I was, you know, kind of thinking about in terms of, you know, the monsters that are being kind of fought uh, to make the place habitable. Um, so by the end of the first cycle of images, the, the protagonist um, creates his own version of a Hogan, right? So I happen to have a wonderful uh, studio uh, at this time. I was doing a big public art project in Tucson um, that I'll, I'll quickly go through because of time. Um, but we had this amazing studio that was a fire station down in Tucson. Uh, this is the, the, you know, the finished product or the first exhibition of the autoimmune response um, work. So I've got to bring the Hogan, again, installation, art, uh, kind of contextualizing the way that, that you, you read the photographs. Um, so these are kind of studies about the, the process and the project. You know, weaving is, is an incredibly important, you know, art form, tradition, um, something that I, I'll talk about in a second. Um, you know, uh, I was trying to imagine different ways that this story would continue. Uh, and, and one thing I was thinking about was food. Um, you know, I mentioned before that, that my grandparents, you know, they pretty much provided all of the nutritional support necessary to, to feed our extended family between the fields and the sheep. Um, and, you know, that doesn't really exist anymore. Uh, no one's kind of taken over that mantle and, you know, it's really hard work to be out in the with the sheep every day. So 
my um, my cousins have like converted all of their grazing permits to to cattle, um, and so there's been a transition. You know uh, what used to be you know I guess understood as a food shed where everybody's kind of making and producing their own food has kind of become a food desert um, in just a few generations. Um, so I was thinking about that, thinking about you know food, um, important food ways, um, and imagining how this character might deal with that situation. Um, this is a little bit of a different project, but I'm also interested in kind of the history of photography and the history of different processes, right? Um, because I came up purely, you know, analog, film-based, and I had to pretty much teach myself digital. Uh, this is actually a blend of a very old historic process called wet plate with uh, digital. So I kind of shot both ways at the same moment um, and was able to blend the two together. Um, this is a, a much more recent version of, of the autoimmune response project. Now, you know, my daughter and my mom are involved. Um, and, you know, I kind of see this project as ongoing. I'm not sure which way it's going, but I'll keep working on it pretty much as long as I can uh, manage a camera. Um, so this is a little bit of a shift, and I'm going to go fast through this. But, you know, uh, if you're thinking about different ways that you might um, make a living as an artist, uh, public art and um, art in public places is, is uh, an interesting kind of way to go about it. Um, I was lucky to have a good friend and collaborator. We got a nice um, grant or, well, it was a public project that we won uh, to create a large scale mural. Uh, and we made our mural out of glass. Um, you know, instead of a pixel, we used uh, a three quarter inch square glass um, tile. And if you aggregate enough of these tiles and you step back a little bit, you know, the, the image starts to, to become visible, right? And so this is called the Barrio Nito Mural Project. Uh, we ended up working in this community of Barrio Nito in Tucson for uh, three years, um, you know, doing kind of intensive oral history, kind of photo history of, of the community, and then work together with with the community the neighborhood to uh, design the mural everybody uh in the mural is actually you know has a strong tie to that neighborhood to that barrio um and after you know a year of um well it took us eight months to design it a year to produce it and about six more months to actually install it um, so that's the interstate. So that's I-10 back there behind the mural. And this is a, a park called Ore Park in, in Tucson. Um, out of that, we ended up kind of developing a studio and for a few years did a number of um, kind of public art commissions. Uh, oh, so this one's at Sky Harbor International Airport in Phoenix. Um, and this one um, is in Philadelphia. Um, and Philadelphia has this amazing mural arts program. Um, my collaborator on that, I should say, his name is Josh Sarantitis, um, and he's still doing a lot of public art. Um, one thing that um, I, I've always wanted to do, I've also wanted to learn to weave. Um, and I dreamed up a way to use the same kind of technology that we use to map um, this big photograph, this big glass photograph um, with very small glass beads. Uh, and that's how the iDazzler project came about. So basically, um, I took one of my, uh, my grandma's rugs, which I own, um, scanned it in, ran it through our software. And instead of a three quarter inch piece of glass as our pixel, now we're working with four millimeter beads. Right, and so I found online these, these looms that are beading looms. Uh, they're called Mirix beading looms. Somebody in Maine makes them, um, but they're totally designed after the Navajo stand-up loom. 
Um, so very similar kind of process. And I often do stuff in collaboration, right? So that, that public art project that you saw before was a big community art project that had a ton of participants. Um, this was a collaboration with five other artists, um, Joy Farley, Pamela Brown, um, both Diné women who grew up weaving um, and who were colleagues here in Santa Fe at the museum that I was working at. My friend, Jamie Smith, who's Cherokee and Choctaw, and then uh, Dylan McLaughlin, um, who's also Diné, uh, and a, you know, a filmmaker. And he just actually got his MFA from um, the University of New Mexico in their land art program. And hopefully we'll um, get to see some of his work in the future. But he made this video. So I'm going to show you a three minute long piece. Um, and, and then I'll, then I'll really hurry up. <laughs> um, so the one thing that we changed about my, you know, my grandmother's design is that we created these QR codes. So you can scan this rug and it leads you to this video. Um, So I'll probably skip through a couple of these other projects because um, I want to get to some of the other work. But, um, you know, that was my mom and, and an auntie of mine. And they're, you know, they're talking about a weaving process that, that makes a two-faced rug, right? Um, and so, you know, I was so uh, lucky to have that, that, that sound clip from them to, to be part of that, that kind of amazing little uh, video that Dylan put together for us. So we commissioned him to create that. I did a project um, where I wove the sacred mountains, you know, so I actually um, went to each of, of the four sacred mountains and shot 
video with, with this guy, the autoimmune response protagonist at these different sites. Um, and so when you scan the QR codes that are um, associated with each color, each mountain, you'll, you'll actually be taken there to, to those sites. And I should say that all of this stuff is on my website too. Um, this is a different project called uh, the Critical Indigenous Photographic Exchange. Um, and this is really, it's a portrait project. Um, it's a portrait project that uses a historic photographic process called wet plate, which was kind of the photographic process from about 1850 to 1880. Um, I think it's significant to note that, you know, during the Huilde or the, the Long Walk, the first photographs, known photographs of, of Diné people were made with this specific process um, at Fort Sumner while, um, you know, Diné people were essentially prisoners of war. Um, so, you know, I think in terms of a kind of a history of photography, it's, it's one of the reasons I use this. Another reason I use it is to kind of just evoke like old time photographs. Um, and I, I think you've talked about Edward Curtis and his really big project called the North American Indian, you know, for 30 years, he set out to photograph all of the indigenous communities west of the Mississippi starting in um, 19, oh, oh, shoot, I want to say 1907. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think in a lot of like, kind of broader American culture, like when, when folks think of Native America or Native Americans, they still think about these images, um, not mine, uh, Edward Curtis's, right? So this, this kind of um, historic, romantic, um, historic uh, image. And so I kind of set out with this historic process to take pictures of um, contemporary, um, Indigenous people saying, hey, you know, we're still here. Um, probably the most well-known Curtis photograph, and it was the, the first image he used in the North American Indian portfolio. Um, it was shot uh, in Canyon de Chez, and it was a group of Navajo kind of riding off into the sunset, and it was called the Vanishing Indian. Um, and so this is, you know, a kind of response to that idea. Uh, this guy is Edward Curtis. Not this guy is Joe Horse Capture, who is, um, you know, an indigenous curator. He used to work at the National Museum of the American Indian. Now he's out at the Autry. Um, but when I put this project together in 2012 at, in, at the Santa Fe Indian Market, um, he saw my iPad sitting there and he grabbed it and, and he, he pulled up the image of horse capture that Edward Curtis made of his great, great, great grandfather. And so kind of in one image, he was able to kind of sum up my whole project. Um, so that's what he's holding in the photograph. But, you know, this is an ongoing project that I've been, you know, doing since 2012. Um, and, you know, um, I'd love to come out and share it <laughs> when, 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 you know, we all can be together again, um, kind of in a, in, a, in a shared space, a shared photo space. Um, so I'll move quickly through these, but, you know, I literally have thousands of these, these portraits now. Um, I kind of did, took a hiatus during COVID, um, but I'm going to go to Ohio in a couple of weeks to kind of kick off the project again. Um, this is a sub project. I'm collaborating with a, a dance professor in Texas, Adam McKenney. Um, and it's actually to memorialize um, the lynching of a man in Fort Worth in 1921. Um, but we developed a technology called talking tin types. Um, if you download the app uh, and you scan this image on your phone or on your iPad, uh, Adam will dance. Um, so it's, 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 it's cool. Um, so this is, um, I think the, the most kind of, uh, current project and the thing that I'm really kind of most excited about. Uh, I don't know if any of you were around in, in the late eighties, um, 
in Tuba City, but there used to be this uranium processing mill four miles out of town called Rare Metals. Um, and this is the ruins of the Rare Metals uranium processing mill and behind there um, are uranium tailings. Now this is a super fun site, right? So um, from around 1948 to 1971, the Atomic Energy Commission of the United States was the sole purchaser of uranium in the United States. And I think close to half of all of the uranium that went to you know, the American arsenal uh, came from, from the Four Corners region and in particular from, from the Navajo Nation. Uh, it was mined by Navajo miners um, who were not warned of the dangers um, of the toxicity of this material. Um, and, you know, people would come home covered in yellow cake to their families. Uh, houses were built from the materials that were mined from, from this, this toxic, dangerous um, material. Uh, and it continues today, you know. So I've, I've been um, developing this project for a few years and, and we just got a nice grant from the Native Arts and Culture Foundation uh, it's called the SHIFT grant, um, and it's a two-year grant, $100,000 um, of support, uh, and it's in collaboration with Diné College. So um, since we're all kind of virtual these days, the first part of it will focus on a speaker series, um, trying to rethink what remediation can mean, you know, uh, from an Indigenous standpoint. So we're going to invite artists, scientists, hopefully some um, Diné um, policy folks, the, you know, the new um, director of the Navajo Nation EPA, I'm hoping, um, to, to talk about different ways that this problem might be addressed. Um, and then in the meantime, um, so this is a map of, of over 500 uh, and 20 of these different sites that are, you know, located throughout the nation. And I'm sure uh, this is, this is a, a situation that's familiar to a lot of you. Um, but I'm hoping to do a photographic survey to a large extent of a lot of these sites. First of, of you know, the landscapes and the sites themselves, but then hopefully um, talk to to stakeholders, to frontline community members who are kind of dealing with these issues and hopefully coming up with solutions in relation to them, right? Um, I'm sure some of you know people who've been affected by this. Um, something else that occurred on, on right outside of the Navajo Nation was the United uh, Nuclear Corporation's Church Rock Uranium spill, which is actually the worst kind of nuclear accident in United States history. Um, and I just bring that up because not a lot of people are aware of that, it's certainly not in the United States. Um, but these are some of the images from the Connecting the Dots, um, you know, the beginning of, of the survey and the situation. Uh, you know, over on the far side, on the left, you can see my pickup. Um, and this is actually just um, south, um, off of 89, south of, of the border uh, of the Navajo Nation um, on the Babbitt Ranch. And uh, this was a uranium processing mill. Um, and it's also right next to the Little Colorado River. Um, here's another vision of it. Um, you know, a lot of these places aren't even kind of marked off or fenced off. And they're potentially, you know, sites where I'll go back to this, where depressions in the landscape can fill with water and livestock might drink from, you know, these radioactive ponds. Um, and then that gets into the foods, the food cycle um, and, and we end up eating it. Um, this is actually uh, a drone photograph of the uranium, I'm sorry, the United uh, Nuclear Corporation's church rock spill site. So one of the ways um, that the different remediation projects hope to protect the groundwater underneath these sites is by essentially putting plumbing underneath them 
and pulling out the, the ground, the water before it gets to the groundwater level and then evaporating it um, and then taking away some of the, the material that way. Um, this is at Mexican Hat, um, just north of the town of Halchita uh, in Utah. Um, and this is probably like the largest remediated site uh, on the nation. Um, you know, something else that I think is, is pretty remarkable about like tr drone technology is, is the way that it, it enables um, kind of our understanding of this. Because if you're on the ground level, you can't really kind of see or understand how, how vast these, these spaces are. Um, but, you know, once you get like a thousand feet up in the air, your, your view of the world is totally transformed. Um, so when I was flying over, over that, um, that disposal cell, um, I noticed that there was something out in the middle of it. Uh, and I was able to send my drone out. And there's actually a plaque in the very center of this, this kind of field of river rocks. Um, and as you zoom in closer, you know, this is, this is the plaque where it says that 4,400,000 tons of radioactive material um, are buried at this site. Um, there was a uranium processing mill here, um, and then a lot of the tailings from the local mines in the Monument Valley um, and Kane Valley area were brought to this, this disposal cell. Um, this is actually the last remaining kind of traditional uranium processing mill. And this is not on the Navajo Nation. This is two miles north of the Ute Mountain Reservation um, in Utah. Um, and there's been a fair amount of kind of activism and kind of monitoring of this because the, you know, the Ute Mountain folks are very concerned that their, their water is um, potentially going to be contaminated by the uranium that's being processed at this site. Um, but that's what the, um, the kind of connecting the dots project will focus on. Um, I, I wanted to share this other thing just quickly. Um, this is actually um, drone video, right? So not only can you take still photographs, but you can also understand these different sites um, you know, in a very three-dimensional way with the, with the um, capability of the drone. And I'm just going to do a kind of a zoom through on this for time's sake. So, you know, I sent the drone up and you can totally experience the world in a very different way. Um, I was over here at this truck. Oh, Bill, I don't think it's on our screen. Oh, you're not seeing the, the video? No. Okay. Here, wait, let me stop sharing and then I'll share again. Okay. okay. Are you seeing it now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Here, I'll just do a little back track. <laughs> so what I was just trying to scrub through with the video is, is, is this. Um, and, you know, I, the drone is just an amazing new tool to kind of understand the world photographically. Um, and I was saying that I was, I'm situated over here where my cursor is. I don't know if you can see my cursor, um, but next to my truck back there. And then this is that plaque that's out there in the middle of the... the disposal cell. All right, with that, I will stop sharing. So hopefully you guys have some uh, 
some hard questions for me, <laughs> so, or at least some some general questions, but hard ones would be good too. Um, um, Will, thank you so much. I want. I just wanted to lead off the questions. Yeah, <laughs> I wanted to lead off the questions by asking you how these good people on this um, Zoom call can get involved um, at Danae College with working with you. Uh, could you say a little more about that? Um, yeah, I, well, I'm so I should say that I'm here in Santa Fe now, um, and I run the Santa Fe Community College uh, photo program. So I teach photography here. Uh, I've also been a teacher at the um, the Institute of American Indian Arts here in Santa Fe. Um, some of you may know of that school and program. Um, I, I know that like through uh, a collaboration with Professor Cruz over in photography, we're gonna, um, you know, we're gonna start this project with um, a speaker series. So hopefully um, you guys will be able to see some of the, the different speakers. Um, we're also gonna archive all of those lectures uh, as a resource um, online. Um, and then I think pretty soon uh, after that's kind of underway, um, Professor Cruz and I, and then Kayla Jackson, who's also kind of um, a coordinator with the project, um, will be offering, um, I think, some workshops. Uh, I mean, they're going to have to be virtual right now, um, but um, I'm, I'm really hoping in, in the near future we can actually be together in person. Uh, part of that grant is going to support um, a fair amount of technology for the, the Dene um, College photo program. So, you know, we're going to be buying cameras, potentially drones, um, potentially some studio kind of uh, portraiture equipment. Um, and I would love to work with you all to kind of share those skills. Um, and then, you know, hopefully uh, in the future, um, kind of go out into the field, into different communities and photograph some of these places. Um, you know, I think part of our, one of the goals is to actually potentially um, interview stakeholders from different communities, um, do presentations to different chapter um, chapters you know within the communities to to talk about this issue and to share some of our findings in relation to to that um so you know hopefully there'll be a lot of different ways and uh certainly if you have any ideas or interest uh, particularly you know i'm 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 available all the time you can reach out to me directly or if you ever make it to santa fe um you know i'm here um, I know there's some exciting stuff going on with uh, the, the new BFA program and, and the potential for students to come to uh, uh, Santa Fe and, and they have a new uh, MFA pho photo program, or not photo program, just an MFA program in general uh, at the Institute of American Indian Arts. So, you know, I, th I think there's a lot of potential, uh, but we will definitely be like, um, making uh, specific workshops uh, in the near future that hopefully you'll participate in or be interested in participating in. Uh, great. Um, are there a couple questions? Uh, Barb, uh, Quintana had some questions or had a question. <laughs> Hi. So Hi. Um, first off, I really like the uh, murals that you showed us that you worked on mm -hmm. uh, and how, you know, the process behind actually making those murals, like you know, turning a photograph essentially into something much bigger. <laughs> so what, one of my questions, you know, aside from just admiring the process, uh, it's actually like, where is that um, mural in Tucson? Because I live with, well, I'm not living there right now, but my family lives down there and I'm pretty sure I've seen it before, but I can't remember where it is. Um, it's in it's in a place called Ori Park, uh, which actually they named, they renamed, um, I think everybody still calls it Ori Park though. Uh, it's, uh, oh gosh, uh, Ramon Quiroz, David Herrera and Ramon Quiroz Park. 
is is the new name of it and and both of those men are are you know prominently featured in the mural um there's a um you know there's a parks and recs place there and there's a swimming pool and baseball field um but barrio nita is between speedway and um oh gosh what's the other big street down there it's right next to the interstate. So it's just um, east of I-10 uh, between Speedway and whatever, the, I think University. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I know, okay. So if you go to Ori um, Park, you can't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then my second question is um, about like the types of camera you use for photographs. So I'm not, a photographer and I'm in the BFA, pro, uh, BFA pro, uh, program here, but with um, traditional art, so painting and drawing. But uh -huh. I really want to get like a good camera at some point to partially to document my work, but also to take pictures of stuff because I don't like to use my phone to take uh -huh. pictures. <laughs> so I, I guess uh, like as a like professional photographer, what would be like a camera that you would recommend for it? Oh boy. Um, I mean, that's a, <laughs> I, I grew up shooting Nikon. So I kind of got a soft spot for Nikon. Um, you know, everything is going mirrorless now. Um, so I think like the, the latest Nikon mirrorless is like a Z5 or something like that. I have a Z6, which is a full frame mirrorless and I really like it. Um, but you know, I mean, most of those, most of those kind of entry model uh, mirrorless cameras are really good. Um, you know, but once you go one direction, you kind of get stuck there because of the lenses. So, you know, if you end up investing in a few lenses, then you want to keep using them. So you're kind of stuck there. And, and that's why I, I kind of stayed with Nikon for so long because I have all of these, these really nice lenses, but I did just jump ship to Sony. So I just got a Sony mirrorless and it's, and it's an amazing camera. Um, there's a place called dpreview.com where you can, you can like put a bunch of different cameras up and compare them against each other. And they also, you know, write reviews all the time. But, Thank this, you. For the analog stuff, I use an eight by 10, like old school, like, kind of big camera that that you know I, I'm essentially making film for. So Will, there's a number of questions in the chat and I'm gonna just try and uh, combine uh, a couple of them. Um, you know, um, Antonia asked, um, you know, what's the most challenging um, aspect about your projects? Uh, Francis asked, you know, what, what are the hard obstacles that you had to overcome? And Galena asked, which one of your projects or single piece are you most proud of? Um, I don't know if you can maybe combine those. I mean, one, one challenge is funding projects for sure. Um, and, and, you know, trying to make a living as an artist. I, I think I knew pretty early on that I wanted to to try and make a living as an artist. And, and the, the thing that I saw as a career was to be a teacher. Um, and in order to teach at the college level, the MFA is kind of like the standard. So for me, pretty early on, I was like, well, I'm gonna try and get into the best photo program or get the best MFA I can. Um, and then in the mean, you know, kind of, like in that process, I think, um, you know, just, I, I guess, developing a project, really kind of getting some strong um, foundational images, um, and then talking to people about it and deciding which way you want to go with it. Um, and, and then being able to write about it is really important too, like, so that other people can understand like a why it's interesting to you and important to you, but why it also might be interesting in, to to other folks. Um, 
you know, I, I'm super proud of that rug project where I, where I transformed my grandmother's rug into this kind of interactive piece. Uh, I think that that was something that I really um, love, but I'm super excited um, and a little bit scared and anxious about this current project because, um, you know, it's big and it's, it's ambitious and it's, you know, it's hoping to, I guess, bring awareness about the problem of, you know, uranium on, on the Navajo Nation, uh, first to Navajo people and then to kind of the broader public. Um, and then hopefully, you know, help in, in, in the process of coming up with solutions like, Maybe you shouldn't uh, water your sheep over there or let your cattle <laughs> drink from that water source, you know, um, or, you know, maybe we just need to get some signs up or make a, a really good interactive map so that people know, like, kind of where, like, toxicity exists. Um, you know, I, so when I think about that, I, I, I think about big challenges, you know, um, but then I also think, well, you know, I'm a photographer, I'm an artist. If I focus on doing what, what I know I can do well, which is making images that communicate to people, you know, like staying focused on that, I think will be a good kind of goal as I move forward or as we move forward. Um, so I hope that answered some of those questions. Um, there were a couple of others um, as well that I wanted to bring up that were uh, posted here in the chat. Uh, Samantha Begay um, asked if you could say more about um, the kind of photographic exchange that happens between you and the people that you are photographing. I mean, how is that it, uh, a ritual, she asks. And then yeah. she also, yeah. And then she also asks, um, how do you choose the person that you want to photograph for your critical indigenous photographic exchange series? How do you choose those individuals? Well, um, I mean, one of the ways when I first started the project, I knew, I knew that I wanted to photograph people in my community, right? So, and then I thought about that a little broad. Uh, I was working at the time at II's museum, uh, which is called the, the Museum of Contemporary Native Art, and definitely understand myself, uh, I'm, I'm a contemporary indigenous artist, right? And so I was thinking about other artists as part of that community. Uh, so that was the first um, kind of focus. Uh, you know, I set up during a time when there are literally thousands of indigenous artists kind of like coming to Santa Fe. Um, and so I put the word out on Facebook and people just showed up. Um, and it's not just, you know, it, it's an exchange and maybe kind of a ritual uh, because I've changed some of the, you know, the, the parameters of what it means to get your portrait done. So if you sit down and you know, we decide to do this portrait, it takes about 30 minutes. It's kind of slowing everything down. I'm kind of having a conversation with the person. Uh, I'm showing them this historic photographic process. Um, so, you know, I show you like every step of the way. I have a dark room with me. You have to have a dark room with you with this process. So people get to come into the dark room and actually watch their image develop. Um, and then I give them the original photograph. Uh, in exchange for a scan of it. So, you know, um, that's the exchange part. You get to walk away with this cool kind of one of a kind image of yourself. Um, and I get uh, a scan of it that I can kind of add to this growing body of, of portraiture that I'm doing. Um, and, you know, uh, in terms of how who do, how I choose usually when I do it now I'm doing it through an institution so I'm doing it at a college or at a museum um, and they uh, you know have brought me there because they want to share my work with their audience and that could be their students or that could be their kind of museum audience uh, they know that I'm interested in taking pictures of indigenous people uh, so they try and reach out to their community 
Um, and I think that helps develop a relationship with indigenous folks wherever I'm going and that institution. But it's also open to anybody who's interested in photography. So it's not just, you know, native folks who I'm taking pictures of, it's, it's anybody who wants to participate. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think it's about um, that kind of engagement, that kind of, you know, there's an aspect of generosity, there's an aspect of exchange. Um, I'm getting to share something that not a lot of people get to see anymore because everybody, you know, you can take a picture with your phone like in a second, but like this old style photograph, you know, it takes like 30 minutes and you get to like see film being made and, and developed, which is, which is different and unique, I think. Um, um, Tom Yazzie had a question. Go ahead, Tom. Hello, Mr. Wilson, or well, good afternoon. Um, thank you for sharing your um, presentation with me, with us today. Uh, my question to you is, when you're out shooting, uh, what essential items besides a camera and a lens do you take with you? Um, I usually have my laptop with me <laughs> and my phone, um, you know. Uh, I think the phone can be a really good like way to frame up shots, you know, so even before like I pull out my, my quote unquote real camera, I'm, I'm using my phone to kind of like preview what something might look like from, you know, different vantage points, low, high, um, what else, you know, the computer is a gateway to the universe. If I have any questions about a setting or something that I can't remember or figure out, I can, you know, access it quickly through the phone or through, through my computer. Um, when I travel with my, my wet plate equipment, I have a whole like bunch of stuff. I have a whole dark room with me. Um, I'm using an ice fishing tent as a dark room right now because they're really almost black inside. Uh, I'm carrying all the chemicals that I need. I'm carrying a bunch of different cameras. Um, so I usually have like a truck full of stuff. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just uh, one more question, I think. Um, Cynthia asked about, if I can find it here. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, I, she was wondering about, did you create the scan for the images in order to make it live? She read this in the articles. However, she was not able to try it. Um, is it similar to the photos you showed today in class? I'm not quite sure. Maybe you can figure out what that question is. I'm not quite sure I fully understand it. I think she might be talking about the app. Um... So I have this app and it's either, you can get it from the, like the Play Store or from the Apple um, uh, App Store. It's called Talking Tin Types. Uh, I can send you guys a, a QR code um, that, that students can scan to download the app. And then there are certain images, not every image works, um, but there's a section on my website um, with talking to types. And if you have the app, which looks like, um, oh, let's see if I can find it on my phone. So I don't know if you can see this. This is what the app looks like. I have a Samsung. When you click on it, it looks like that. And it's called talking tin types. Um, and once it goes through that initial screen there, you hit the begin button. Um, and then you just look at the photograph. So you point it at the photograph and you'll see your image or you'll see my image on, on your screen, but then the person will start talking to you. Um, so it's, it's called augmented reality. It's like a Harry Potter like picture on the wall that talks to you. <laughs> um, uh, I'm trying to think of other applications recently that have used AR that way. 
but there used to be a commercially available app, but they went bankrupt. So I worked with some developers to create my own app. Um, but so there's a section on my website that, that's called Talking Tin Types. Uh, and if you scan any of those images, those people will start speaking to you. Um, so, you know, it's again, oh, go ahead. No, 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 please. Oh, I was just saying that it's playing with this idea of, you know, like old school photos and then very new technology kind of blending them together and almost, um, you know, uh, kind of playing with people's um, expectations. You know, you see this like old timey picture of, a, of an indigenous person and then you scan them and then all of a sudden they start talking to you about, you know, being um, the first full blooded senator uh, from Oklahoma, um, you know, from the Seminole Nation or, you know, um, I have one where uh, this this Hopi woman, um, Melissa Pochema, she's she's got the the squash blossom or like the butterfly whirl hair like and she does princess leia's speech um to obi-wan kenobi except she's doing it to pope and pope led the pueblo revolt in uh 1680 so we reworked um the the the, the text from the star wars um obi-wan kenobi speech um and she's she's saying, Pope, uh, you're our only hope. <laughs> and you know, he led the Pueblo revolt. 